Good morning or afternoon or evening. Welcome to the Scripture Habit. Welcome to this resource, this community, this space, whatever we can be for you. Our goal is to help you develop the habit of getting into Scripture every day. But we know Scripture can be intimidating sometimes. We get it. So we show up. We say, hey, we'll meet you and we'll discuss it together. My name is Rebecca Palmas here. I'm a pastor. I get to be a host here at the Scripture Habit and I say welcome. Yeah. All right, we are in the study of the Gospel of John, and we're in chapter 10. Yesterday, we covered verses 1 through 6. Today, we're going to get through verse 21. We're going to wrap up this idea of Jesus as the Good Shepherd. Hi, Raymond. Good morning, Santa. Good morning. I bet you're really busy right now. (laughs) Good morning, Darlene. All right, let's do this. The signal's good. Thank you so much for that feedback. Excuse me, I'm going to open up my caffeine. Shh, don't say anything. All right. I knew you would be. You're like the best Santa. All right. We're going to pray. I know there's still some more people coming in. Let's go ahead and pray, and then we're going to get started. Yeah. (sighs) Good morning, Lord. Good morning, God. We set our attention on you in the middle of all the busy, in the middle of all of the demands or obligations or pressure or any of it. God, we want to quiet our heart before you. We want to draw close to you through your word. Help us, Lord. In your name, amen. Amen. All right. Okay, let's go ahead and let's get it going. The gospel according to John. Here we go. Okay. I want to give two reminders really fast about this section because what we did yesterday was verses 1 through 6, but it's actually really continuing in today. So if you missed yesterday, sorry, I encourage you to go back. Yeah, look at yesterday's video. But this is continuing. So Jesus in this section is using imagery of the good shepherd. And there's a reason why he's using this specific imagery It should be understood or overlaid around this awareness that previous shepherds have done a horrible job. And and by shepherds, we mean kings and leaders. Yeah? So in in light of Old Testament passages that criticize Israel's shepherds who failed in their duty, and we looked yesterday at an Old Testament prophet, Jeremiah, who gave this word And it was a word of rebuke and judgment. And he specifically used the word shepherds. So this is, this is tying imagery. Yeah. Okay. And yesterday we began this awareness that the good shepherd that Jesus is is introducing to the people is distinctly different than other leaders of the past. Um, And we're going to see specifically also religious leaders uh, of the time. So the first thing that set this good shepherd apart was his entrance, right? He said that the good shepherd came through the gate, that anyone that tried to go around it not by the gate was doing this wrong and they were a thief and a robber. He talked about the shepherd's presence with the sheep. There was a confidence, there was a service, And the sheep also recognized the shepherd's voice, and that showed that there was relationship, there was trust. And it even said the shepherd named each sheep by name and called them out by name, right? Beautiful, relational. Nothing is forced here. That's a really big difference. Uh, And I'm sure you can think of examples. Sorry, my guys, my hair is like a little fuzzy crazy today. There we go. You can think of a couple examples of maybe some leaders that you have interacted with in the past. Um, And there are some leaders that try to lead by force and they just try to force their um, authority on you. They try to just demand respect and obligation and obedience, right? Versus other leaders that maybe you served for that have built relationship and established trust. And you find yourself very willing to work and serve, right? Different leadership, 
And Jesus is pointing to a very distinct difference in himself versus those of the past. Yeah. Good morning, Judy. Let's continue. Okay. Here's our reading for today. We're going to pick up at verse 7. And we're going to go through this. We're going to stop as we go rather than reading all the way 7 to 21 and then going back. All right. So I want to point out this first, this first thing. Jesus said again, truly, I tell you, this in verse 7, you'll also see that same truly opening up the chapter. The thing about this truly, some translations will even say verily, verily, if you have like King James. Verily, verily, I say unto you, right? What this is, that that word, that phrase, is an indicator to us that not, so uh, the word studies in the New Testament will say that this formula shows the next thing isn't a completely new idea, but it's actually connecting and building on what preceded it, all right? So we see, we see that here. What was the preceding idea that is being built on? This assumption of the Pharisees to be the only authoritative guides for the people. If we think back to some of the interchanges recently in in our study that Jesus has had with those in religious leadership, he's called them out on some things that are that are wrong. For example, they are really quick to try to enforce rules and regulations. Uh, and they totally disregard the heart of God. An example of that was when Jesus healed someone. Um, he's healed people more than once. We've seen specifically in the Gospel of John, there were two moments of healing that happened on the Sabbath. And the religious leaders were more up in arms and upset that Jesus would do work on the Sabbath than heal someone, right? So in this discourse, we've seen Jesus pointing out, hey, you you are trying to make yourself righteous by trying to follow every letter of the law, which by the way, you don't. You are sinful too. That's what Jesus would say. Um, in fact, we even saw him say at one point, um, you're really upset about me healing on the Sabbath and yet you have no problem with trying to kill me, right? This is what Jesus is building on, especially when we see him talking about himself as the good shepherd, And he's contrasting versus the other shepherds that were not. Yeah. Hi, Annetta and Gloria. Good morning, guys. Yes. Merry Christmas. All right. Here we go. So Jesus said, truly, I tell you. And then he says this statement. I am the gate for the sheep. Let's go ahead and read through nine. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep didn't listen to them. I am the gate. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. Okay, we're going to talk about the I am stuff in a second, all right, when we get down to uh, after 10. But he identifies himself now as the gate for the sheep. Now, he said before that he was the shepherd. He mentioned there was a gatekeeper that stands watch, right? That makes sure that the one that's calling out the sheep has the authority uh, to do so and that he's only calling out his sheep, right? Now Jesus is using this same imagery and he's also saying, not only am I the good shepherd, but I'm also the gate. I am the way in which you're supposed to go, to go in and out, right? Um, And he says, all who came before me are thieves and robbers. And we would ask, who is he talking about all who came before me? Well, if we're looking at what Jesus has been contrasting, the uh, religious leaders that have pushed, you have to obey all the rules to be good enough to be one of God's, right? That's what we would call self-righteousness, trying to make yourself good enough. And which, by the way, you can't ever fully address all of the sin in you, right? Uh, even beyond the religious leaders that are have come before that have pushed rules and obligations, we could think maybe um, other gods. Yeah. Uh, we could also consider sin. Sin itself entered before and it has certainly robbed 
And we're going to talk about that more in, in just a second. So it's interesting to think about all who came before him are thieves and robbers. He said, but the sheep didn't listen to them. The sheep, by the way, when he's talking about sheep here, he's talking about his sheep. The sheep within his flock, right? The ones that know to follow the good shepherd. And so he's saying, my sheep know the difference. My sheep have an understanding that those are thieves and robbers. They are not the good shepherd. And we could say, hey, is that identifying uh, the old way? The sheep know the difference. Identifying and recognizing sin. Knowing who to submit to and follow. Yeah. What do you think? What do you think? Verse 9, he says again, I am the gate. And, I, and, and then he says, if anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. I actually really love this. I almost skipped over this, right? Because we read, I am the gate. And I don't know, in this whole section, the, the phrase that we're going to read later in John, I am the way, the truth, and the life, right? We know that. We know that statement. It, it feels like this, but listen to what he's saying, right? So he's saying, if anyone enters by me, the blessing is he'll be saved. And then I love this, will come in and go out and find pasture. A lot of times I think we just focus, let me do this. A lot of times I think we just focus on the getting into heaven. You know what I mean? We just think, yeah, he's the way we get into heaven. But that is so one dimensional about a relationship with God. And what I love about this little nugget that Jesus said, right? He said that those who come through me, they can come in and go out. And when I think of sheep, I think of um, a pen as a place of safety. There's, there's safety in numbers, there's security, it's guarded, right? The benefit and blessing of the pasture is is there's abundant food and there's adventure that you get to experience going out, but you also have this place of safety. Beautiful, right? I love that that promise when he's talking about the gate, the, that he also mentioned the pasture. We get to experience the pasture. We get to experience following the shepherd and watching him point out the tufts of grass for us to eat along the way. Yeah. I would have totally skipped that, right? Would you? Would you have skipped that too? Be like, oh yeah, I know he's talking sheep stuff. Okay, verse 10, he's talking about the thieves again. A thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come so that they may have life and have it in abundance. A thief comes. We, we quote this verse uh, often. You might know this, right? John 10, 10. We think of the thief first and foremost as Satan, right? The, the thief, yes. And uh, sin, yes, yes. If we also think about those corrupt kings and leaders of Israel's past, we can see that they follow their own self-interest at the expense of everybody else. In fact, the bad shepherds, the previous kings, would tax the people so that they can build up their treasury. They would build buildings on the backs of slaves, on the backs of their citizens. They had no problem hurting everybody else. And in fact, sometimes even killing or having other people's lives laid down for their own self-interest. And that motivation, some might say, is human nature. And I would say that is Satan himself. Satan himself. Satan wanted to be worshipped like God. And in fact, that was the, the enticement that Satan gave to the other angels that he wanted to try to get them to come with him to like start this, this coup. Come with me. You can be gods. You can have people worship you too, right? But their motivation for their kingdom was very self-focused. 
They wanted to be worshipped. They wanted to be adored. They wanted to have the power. They wanted to have the allegiance. Um, that motivation that we often see in some leaders, not all leaders, um, we can see how destructive it is. Why is it destructive? Because it's all about them. And that is a monster that you can never fully feed, friend. That monster will always be there, getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Nothing will ever satisfy it. And they'll begin to um, kill, steal, destroy. They'll compromise to continue that. You ever? You, can you think of an example of that? Can you? Hmm? Share it if you think of one. But he says here in the contrast, Jesus says, that's other motivations, but this is my motivation. I have come, Jesus says, so that they may have life and have it in abundance. Key difference with Jesus and his leadership. Jesus as the good shepherd is that his motivation is all about the sheep. His motivation isn't to set up and establish a kingdom for himself, is not to set up um, people who are bound by allegiance. No, Jesus's motivation for coming is to bring us life, to bring us life, to restore us to what God intended for us from the beginning, abundant life, not just scraping by life, not just barely hanging on life, and listen, what I love about that too, when we talk about abundance, a lot of times people only think about material stuff. But listen, if you're following, if you're following a belief system that says you have to be good enough to earn it, you will always feel like you might not be there. And you're going to be scraping by doing your best effort, right? To just try to get in. If you're just following that, I have to tip the scales to be more good than bad. No. This life that Jesus gives us, a life in abundance, when we experience the gift that we didn't deserve, that we didn't earn, but Jesus, out of love for us and our best interest, wants to give us life, we end up experiencing more peace, more satisfaction, more fullness of life. A life in abundance. Yeah? That's what Jesus brings us. And that is what is so different from other shepherds that are not good. Yeah? So then he says, I am the good shepherd. There's another I am. I am the gate. Now I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Really quick. Right there. He points out another aspect of the shepherd. We talked about the entrance. The shepherd's entrance is distinctly different. Different. His presence and his voice are distinctly different because they come out of relationship. They're not forceful. They're built on trust. And then the shepherd's sacrifice is so distinctly different. He elevates others above himself and he sacrifices himself for the sake of others. A good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I want to point out really briefly, we could do a whole study on Jesus's I am statements. Um, in fact, I've seen like sermon studies and Bible studies on it. I just want to point out a few really fast. I'm going to throw them up here. Boom. Jesus so far, just in the gospel of John has said, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the one who testifies the witness, right? I am the one before Abraham. Before Abraham even existed, I was there. Before the establishment of God's people, what we would know as Israel, before him, Jesus was. And then he said that we're seeing today, I am the gate for the sheep and I am the good shepherd. Verse 12, the hired hand, since he's not the shepherd and doesn't own the sheep, leaves them and runs away when he sees a wolf coming. The wolf then snatches and scatters them. This happens because he's a hired hand and doesn't care about the sheep. Ooh, this is good. This is good. A hired hand. 
Jesus is pointing out there's a distinct difference between a hired hand, someone who is working with sheep, but he's not the shepherd. A hired hand is not personally invested in the health and success of the flock, right? He's getting paid, so he has a self-interest, but a hired hand puts their own well-being, their own safety, their own security, their own interests ahead of the flock. We could think and stew. All right, following Jesus's picture and metaphor, who might those hired hands be? People that are working with the sheep, but it's really clear they're still not the shepherd. Yeah? Mm, stew. We won't stay there, but do. That's good. So then Jesus says again, I am the good shepherd. He's so distinctly different. Um, I do point down right here. When he's talking about the shepherd to make no mistake, there's a connection to King David, who was adored and loved, right? King David, the mighty King David, stories are shared about him, about how he defeated Goliath and how he was a shepherd. In fact, He was a shepherd that just used stones to defeat Goliath. And where did he get those stones? How did he know how to use that that slingshot? Because he guarded and protected sheep from bears, from lions. He would put his life at risk to save those sheep, right? All of this imagery is showing up. And so Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own My own know me. We're not going to dig in too much into that because we already talked about that when we're talking about knowing the voice, right? Relationship. Verse 15, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. I lay down my life for the sheep. Pause for a minute and just think. They would think about this for the shepherd, right? But they don't see and know what we know about how Jesus truly laid down his life for the sheep. They don't know that yet. Yeah? Verse 16. We love this one. Verse 16. He says, but I have other sheep that are not from this sheep pen. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. Then there will be one flock one shepherd. Who were the other sheep? He's talking about, okay, there's this sheep in this pig pen, or a pig pen, ugh, sheep pen. There's this sheep. Who's the other sheep? Who's he talking about, guys? Give me a minute. Put it in the comments. What are you thinking? Hi, Gloria. Hi, Vicky. Good morning. I already told you good morning, Gloria, but still double. Yeah. Who are the other sheep that Jesus is talking about here? He is talking about Gentiles. What are Gentiles? Gentiles are are not Jews. Yeah? Um, we We could dig into that forever, for a long time. But what I want you to see is, again, from the very beginning, God's plan has always been to save all people, all nations would be saved and blessed through the line of Abraham, the line of David, which we would say those descendants are the Jews, right? But it's never been exclusive. It's never been, oh, you have to become Jewish to be saved. No, 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 no. Jesus says, I have other sheep. They're in other pens, but they are my sheep, right? They, they might not be in this group that's like securely together, protecting one another, being protected by that that guard, that gatekeeper. But I have other sheep. They're in other pens. They know me too. And really, we're all one flock and one shepherd. That's beautiful. Verse 17. 17 and 18. So Jesus says, this is why the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. These next statements that Jesus makes, he's talking about himself and the Father. And make no mistake, like, what's the fullness of what Jesus is saying here? 
there's a there's so much to it, right? And I, I can't help but think about the people that were hearing him as he's giving this message, um, how confusing it must have been. They would catch imagery. They have to connect the dots just like we do, but they actually don't have more of the history that we do, right? He talks about himself and the Father. And this relationship, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, uh, that can be confusing, can't it? Three in one. Some would say uh, or suggest that, that it's all one person, that God the Father is pretty much the same as God the Son. He's just in a body. And God the Spirit, that's God's spirit, um, but that they're all the same. And, and what we have to catch, like the blow your mind part of the Trinity is like yes and no. Yes, because they're all God. They are all God and, and it's God manifested differently, but they are distinct, different persons. Because when they were all together at creation, it didn't just say God, I created. Even then it said we. Even then it said we, this holy God who is one. We're not going to spend too much time in the Trinity. But the Father and the Son. The Pillar New Testament commentary points, why is Jesus saying this? The Father loves me because I laid on my life so that I could take it up again. This is why. Jesus' point here is that the sacrificial death of the shepherd, when it occurs, must not be taken as an accident of fate or merely as a tragedy that was perpetuated by misguided men, but as the Father's plan. As the Father's plan. When, when Jesus dies on the cross, you can imagine the sadness, disappointment, heartache, what is going on, especially if the people look to Jesus, the Messiah, as the one who is going to be the new king and restore the kingdom of Israel in this like physical sense with, you know, the lens that they see and know. They would question, was this an, an evil act that cut him off short? No. No, look at what Jesus, and this isn't the only time he says it. He says it over and over repeatedly that I'm going to lay my life down and I will take it up again, but my life is going to be taken. They're going to crucify me. Three days later, I'll rise again. Jesus spoke about this openly to remind us this is exactly the Father's plan. Yeah. We might not understand the why would he do it this way, but this is the plan. And then he says, verse 18, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own. I have the right to lay it down and I have the right to take it up again. I have received this command from my father. Jesus said that the I lay it down on my own. Again, showing his willful obedience to God's plan, his submission, but he's not being forced to do anything. He's a willing participant in this plan. Yeah? You still with me? As we wrap up, 1920 and 21, these are the responses of the people that are hearing. It says, again, the Jews were divided because of these words. Many of them were saying, he has a demon and he's crazy. Why would you listen to him? Others were saying, these aren't the words of someone who's demon possessed. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Jesus says things that to us might make no sense. Jesus says things that to us are confusing sometimes or, you know, it, it's not fully revealed, right? But in those moments where you look and you're like, okay, Jesus, I know you're saying something important. I don't get it, right? That's okay. That's okay. Revelation comes in period, right? As the Lord wills, he reveals it, right? But in the meantime, there are other things that we can lean back into to trust him along the way. And here, what I love is they're like, listen, you can't just write this guy off because his words don't make sense to you. 
He's not crazy because look what he just did. He's been healing blind people. He's been healing lame. He's been doing these miraculous things. You can't write those off because you don't like his words, right? And that's where we're going to be left today. Yeah? Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you. There's such hope when we consider you as the good shepherd, where others have disappointed us, where others at times have misled us. They've caused damage and destruction or death. Moments where we've been disenchanted by following something that did not hold water or measure up. God, we thank you that you are the good shepherd. You are the good shepherd. You are the one who is trustworthy. You are the one who has our best interest at heart without self-motivations. You elevate us above yourself. And we say thank you. We are your sheep. Amen. Amen. That's it for today. Hey, Christmas happens on Monday, so we won't be here Monday. But uh, we will return next week and we'll continue. As you go through the holiday season, remember what we just discussed. Remember, even as I reflect on Christmas, there are still moments where I'm like, God, this is so, I don't know, is it weird? This doesn't make, this doesn't always make sense to me, right? And that's totally okay. But then we look at the person of Jesus. We look at the work that he did, how he manifested God's power, how he manifested God's heart for all creation and all people. And you lean in there and appreciate that this holiday. Appreciate the good shepherd who came and was in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. Have a great Merry Christmas and do me a favor, hit the share button. All right, I'll see you later.